Good morning. Welcome to the Stepping Stones Project. Today is Mother's Day, May 10th, 2015. And uh, my name is Carl Connor. I uh, hope that you have a uh, wonderful Mother's Day wherever you are. We're preaching on the church and a little bit of the nature of uh, our particular church as we work through First Thessalonians. We'll turn to chapter 2, I titled this one, Not in Vain. And uh, yes, my son David's in the background. He's decided to join us for church. We'll go with that. So I shared last week that uh, the Apostle Paul had gone on his second missionary journey uh, about the year 50 AD. Uh, and as he crossed through this area in northern Greece called Macedonia, um, that uh, he had very briefly been in Thessalonica. And uh, it was good to, uh, to find out that uh, uh, while they were only there very briefly, uh, that Paul and, and uh, Silas and Timothy, that uh, they were able to, to make some contact with the people that were there and have an impact, although uh, Paul had to move on very quickly because of the, the mobs, the crowds that were there. So they were concerned as to what had happened. And uh, this is a letter that goes back to them. And so the question then basically was, was it even worth it? Was, it, was this trip to Thessalonica even worth it? And, and, or, or was it in vain, meaning it was useless? So he starts out chapter two with that. For you yourself know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. And today's sermon is going to be a little bit different. There's some personal aspects to this particular one. Um, as I'm thinking about the Stepping Stones project and my particular role as pastor and some of the pieces there. And so forgive me as I wax a, a tad on the personal side as I go through some of these things. So I chose uh, the book of, of, of uh, First Thessalonians actually because of this particular verse. Um, as I'm thinking about the Stepping Stones project, and I feel like I'm at a, a, a point coming in the next few months as to what comes next and, and where have we come and where are we going to. And to be candid, I'm looking over my, you know, there's a, a piece of paper on the wall over here I'm looking at, which says my certificate of ordination. And my ordination certificate is as a minister of the gospel. And uh, I was charged by First Baptist Rockville in Rockville, Maryland, that uh, I was to hold this piece of paper for life unless such a time as I was no longer a minister of the gospel, at which time I was required to surrender it back. So what does that mean to me, to be a minister of the gospel? Well, it, there's several parts to it. And one of the first and foremost pieces is that I'm able to help people become Christians. And by that, I mean that they actually become saved. And so there's a part of my personality that God has wired up to present the gospel. Sheree laughs at me and says, I can take any sermon text and turn it into a gospel presentation. Uh, and, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. But, um, you know, I've worded before that this is sort of like, a, a, you know, a, people are sick and they need a specific blood transfusion. They, they need the blood of Christ. And uh, those salvations and the baptisms that result from that are what, what uh, I'm wired up to do. The second major mission that I have, of course, is to then uh, to uplift and teach and, and to assist the, the saints, those of you that have become Christians, and I think most of you, at least in church today, uh, have become Christians. Uh, perhaps some of you listening to my voice on video afterwards maybe are not. Um, and so then, you know, the, the uplifting and teaching of the saints is certainly my second call, but I have to maintain the first one as well. And so as I look at stepping stones, I, I do look personally, and I feel emotionally tied to, are we having salvations? Am I seeing people be baptized? Is this working? And so there's something I think I want you to be aware of, and that's that in, in, there have been several spots in Stepping Stones where I've tried to consider, is this the most effective pathway for me? Or should, in fact, God, uh, should I be following God in a different manner? And by that, I mean, um, you know, there are other, there are local churches around, there are local church plants that are here. In fact, there's a couple I've looked at that need, a, for example, associate pastor. Maybe that's a better way for me to, to go and, and to, to serve God and be able to, to be in a capacity where maybe I can see more people come to Christ. I, I am where I think God called me to be, and I think it's really important uh, to, to you all to know that, but I am considering where should I be in the future. And so when I've been asking questions like, what does stepping stones mean to you? It is, as we say, something of a pregnant question. This is, this is an important question because I'm trying to decide what should we do there. Or when I ask questions like, um, you know, what if you could change one thing about stepping stones, what would you change? I've had one of you have replied back to me. I, I'd ask you to all prayerfully consider that and say, what, what would we change and why? What would we change? And, and, and I'm, I'm listening for changes that specifically would relate to seeing people get saved. 
Okay, that, that's actually what I'm listening for when I'm asking that question. Just to tip my hand to you guys is I'm listening for, okay, so what, what do we do in terms of the months and years ahead? Should stepping stones continue? Does it continue like this? Does it become something different? Where are we at? I can say with confidence where we have come so far that I can speak to you, my brothers and sisters of Stepping Stones, that my coming to you in this sense has not been in vain. And, and the letters and emails that you have given me recently in speaking to what it has meant for you has been very important for me to confirm that. And so I, I absolutely don't doubt that. But I am questioning where do we go in the future? And so um, this is a moment for you to speak. And if you feel strongly about what we're going to do or not do, now is your moment to let your voice be heard to me, okay? So, verse 2, but though you had already suffered, this is Paul talking about those in Thessalonica, though you'd already suffered and been shamefully treated, oh, we had, we had shamefully treated Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For me personally, this is what I'm speaking of when I speak to this idea uh, of this call for myself as a, as a minister of the gospel. Um, you know, I went through a time period where I didn't preach, um, and uh, you know, I, we did instead of doing some preaching sermons. Some of you might recall that we did uh, some some uh, materials. Uh, there was a series of DVDs we had out called Liquid. We did some pieces there that were more kind of a Sunday school material, but I wasn't really preaching a sermon per se during that time period. I took some time off. And, and, you know, I really felt God test my heart that I wasn't speaking his word in a more direct manner during that time period. And so I came back refreshed and renewed and with a kick in the pants, if you will, to, to go and get, you know, get a two by four up the head that I, I really needed to, to present the gospel. And, and I hope that people are listening. And specifically, I hope that it changes lives because otherwise it's just me talking and we probably all have better things to do than listen to Carl talk. So we speak not to please man, and, and that even includes not to speak, not to please Carl, but to please God who tests our hearts. And, and I can tell you that there is a, a fire uh, from God in my heart uh, in relation to this and, and what he, uh, he certainly calls to me about wanting to make sure that um, his children are perishing and it is time to make sure some of them get snatched out of the fire. Verse 5. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with the pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we are ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. So this in the same way for me at Stepping Stones, each and every one of you, as I pray over you each week and as I think about you, as I think about your needs and try to be the best pastor for you I possibly can be, um, you know, there have been times when uh, challenges have arisen. And I, I hope that when those challenges arise, I hope in the tone of my, my, my calls and my emails, um, I, you know, I, I, how should we say, I, I will not go quietly into that dark night. I, I will I will do everything I can to reach out to you, perhaps uh, even, even uh, you know, to the point of being annoying, and I apologize if I am, but uh, I, I certainly uh, I, I hope in those tones you, you hear that this, uh, the, the tone is one that is me desperately trying to reach out to you. And so uh, you all mean so much to me and the things that we have done and been through. Even the challenging times are still, are still good lessons for me, uh, and they're still good things that I, I, I have so much yet to learn. And uh, I certainly appreciate that. In verse 9, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So this is interesting. This is one of the things <clears throat> that I've, um, you know, I've really struggled with in going through seminary is this concept of what I call intentionally bivocational pastor. That's what I am. I'm somebody who has a day job, a regular 9 to 5 job. Of course, you all know that. Um, and then at the same time, I'm a pastor. And so this is an area where I think this is a good strategy uh, for us to, for, as, a, as the Christian church. Uh, that I'm fond of saying that it's easier to turn computer programmers into pastors than it is pastors into computer programmers. Um, but the same is true for any trade. 
you know, it's easier to, to take auto mechanics and turn them into pastors than it is to turn pastors into auto mechanics or whatever else it is to go through and, and actually uh, be able to earn a living and, and be able to earn a living wage. So even brothers in verse nine, that our labor and toil, we worked night and day. So there, this is where Paul is, is working to support himself. Um, and so I don't know if you know or not, but Paul is what's called a, a leather worker or a tent maker. Um, and so he works in various leather goods. He probably made belts and other types of things, probably sold some to the Romans and other folks that were there. But then he certainly works in as a tent maker. And so, you know, Paul is a bivocational pastor. And it's a fascinating example and I, one that I take to heart personally, I think is very important. So, uh, you know, it's, it, there's never enough hours in the week for everything I want to get done. And yet God gives enough, and, and, and it's, uh, it's a blessing to do what can be done. And uh, with that, I, of course, I share the ministry as much as I can and with everybody else. And I think it's important to think through that. Um, <laughs> my, my plans are what I'd like to do in the church are always more than there's, there's resources in terms of time to be able to do. And so in order to multiply it, I have to have help from others of you. And I thank each and every one of you who to participates in all the things that you do. Um, you probably don't realize what one hour of your time buys me, but it, it buys me much more than one hour. And I, I, it's a multiplier of, of me and God's uh, ability to use us all together. So verse 10, you are witnesses, you personally, you and Stephen Jones, you're witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our contact towards you believers. Well, it's not always perfect, but we try. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, and encouraged you and charged you to a walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So this is something that, you know, I, 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 I mean, I named the church around this, the Stepping Stones Project, that we do not, will not set out a theology where we are, uh, you know, preaching what we call fire insurance. By fire insurance, I mean you get saved, you're not going to go to hell, and therefore, okay, good, you're done, next person. So this, get, it, this speaks back to when I started out the sermon to the second of my major missions, and that's, yes, get people saved, yes, get them baptized, but then it's the uplifting and educating of the saints to be able to take them, saints, I mean all of you, and myself included for that matter, uh, to be able to uh, and, and willing to take people and say, okay, I don't care, you know, you've been a Christian for one year, two years, five, 10, 50, however long, what is your next step with God? I met with a pastor, I had lunch with him this last week. Uh, talking about some local things here in the Northern Virginia area. And uh, I made that statement that regardless whether you've been a Christian for one day or 50 years, there's a next step. And he kind of struck him that he, he hadn't considered that, that as a pastor with a PhD in theology, that God is speaking to him and taking him to his next level. And I think he, he had paused to, to think about that of, where do I need to go? And I'm like, well, I'll pray for you about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, right? And that's certainly there. Verse 13, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work with you in believers. So this is not, I mean, I have to be very careful, and this is sort of interesting. Um, there are moments when I will express my opinion in a sermon, yet I'm trying to rely upon the word of God. And this is something I, you'll hear me say over and over and over again. There are multiple interpretations of certain parts that are possible. So like eternal security is a great example. You will, I believe, always hear me preach from a position of eternal security. That is a position that I feel once saved, always saved. And, and, I, and I personally feel that's well backed up from a biblical perspective. On the other hand, for someone who believes conditional security, which means you can lose your salvation, I can argue that point from a biblical perspective. And I can understand the verses, and I've read them. I personally feel the weight of the evidence comes down, obviously, on the side that I hold, or I would change my position. But the point is, there is good biblical argument for conditional security, and I respect that. And so what I really want people to, to, to be able to walk away from is, this is my position, and this is my position, and this is how I defend it from the Bible. Not my emotion, not my own reasoning, not some personal experience, but from the Bible. And if you can walk away from sermons with that and saying, okay, my position is not the same as Carl's, but I can defend it biblically, and I think with a clear conscience this, this makes sense, well, then I really respect that particular viewpoint, and I think other people should as well. I feel good with that. 
if you if my sermons are just my opinions in that regard, if it's purely all about me, well, then I really have failed in exhorting the word of God. I really have not gone to the level that I needed to be at. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is something that for me uh, to be candid when I was in, you know, as I've been in my seminary classes, particularly my, my second, uh, my advanced preaching class, that was something some people took exception at when I commented that, that, well, my reading of the text is the following. And they're like, you can't say that. You have to say, God said, thus saith the Lord. This is the one and only interpretation. You have to say it with conviction. And um, I, I just, I don't, I don't see things that way. And so this is a very interesting experience for me. So I would hope that you as stepping stones accept as the word of God, even if you don't agree with my exact interpretation, but are willing to then go beyond me that I can be transparent enough. You can look through me and you can see the word of God behind. And it opens up your mind to question, to study, to dig deep, and to come to a spot where you have dug out the mysteries of the faith and you are willing and able to base it upon what the Bible says. Because really that's what it's all about. It's all about what the, you know, the, the the piece there, and uh, how does the Bible treat these things? For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. So, in a sense, we go after all those churches that come before us. We look after all the people in the thousands of 2,000 years of churches that have come before us, and we are imitators of them. And yet, in the same way, the church in Thessalonica was a new thing. It was a new being. We have talked last week about the Bereans and how individually they, re, re, you know, they dug out the Old Testament verses and were able and willing to be able to see what, you know, as to how they related to things. So in the same way, while the Church of Thessalonica comes after and is imitated of the other churches that are there, they're also a new being to ourselves. Same is true for stepping stones. We stand upon the shoulders of giants and that we stand upon thousands of years of tradition to be able to deal with the, you know, the, all the major issues that we look at these traditions. We're part of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's both good and bad. It's good in that we're able to collaborate with them and be able to provide seminaries and missionaries, and we're able to provide wonderful things. The other thing, there's 16.9, I think it's the last number I saw, a million Southern Baptists. Guess what? You're not going to agree with all of them. I don't either. That's part of the nature of what we are and what we do. So this is interesting, this idea that the church at Thessalonica is an imitator of those churches. And yet at the same time, I would have to comment, it's also a new thing. Continuing on, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as it did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but God's wrath has come upon them at last. So this is the essence of the church of Thessalonica has encountered the same challenges other churches have gone before. Are we the same way? Yes, we are. There's challenges here being a church in modern-day America. We have this incredible freedom. To, we're, we're able to gather, and you know nobody's going to throw us in jail for gathering this morning. People in Saudi Arabia this morning don't have Christians there, don't have that same freedom. They know if they are found, they will be thrown in jail. If they are Saudi, and Saudi Arabia national citizens and they are converting to Christianity, jail may be the best of the outcomes. The, 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 the law says they can be put to death. So um, you know, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation there. So we have this tremendous advantage of being in America. We also have a tremendous disadvantage, a tremendous challenge, I guess I could say, in that we have this incredible pluralism stating that there is one right answer to anything is inherently offensive to those who disagree with you. So, you know, if Christianity, I'm sorry, if religion, if religion is kind of like ice cream, what's right, vanilla or chocolate or strawberry? You all remember I did that particular exercise one time. Rocky Road, I think Amy said was hers, or somebody said, maybe it was Sheree. Oh, that was Sheree. Uh, Rocky Road. If your preference is which one tastes better, that's a matter of personal opinion. If, in fact, religion is more like mathematics and there is a single right answer, then it's okay to say this is the one, some answers are closer to right than others, but nevertheless, there is in fact a right answer. I have submitted and I will continue to stand on the fact religion is more like mathematics. There is a single right answer. And those people around us in America who disagree with that are simply going to disagree. And they will find this concept of Christianity claiming to be the one right answer to be inherently offensive. The nature and beauty of stepping stones, in my opinion, is that the Christian church needs to be a safe place to hear a dangerous message. 
The message of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, is a dangerous message. It is that you can't solve it on your own. And that message is not safe for Americans. And by that, I mean Americans like to know what are the steps I have to go through and how do I fix it on my own. That feels nice and safe and comfortable. To say you are out of control and you are helpless without someone helping you is not a popular message in this modern day day and age. Well, if the church needs to be a safe place to hear that dangerous message, what place is more safer than the exact chairs and couches that you are sitting on at this instant in your own living rooms, in your own homes, to be able to go through and listen to this at your own desk, maybe in your own car. This is one of those things that is just critically important for why Stepping Stones, I think, works and why we have to share it with more people. Verse 17, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or our joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? What do I, Carl Connor, have to say of anything that I have accomplished for the Christ when I get to see him in glory? When I'm glorified and I cast my crowns before him, if I have anything to say, it is the growth I have seen in you the growth I have seen in each and every one of you, where you have come from, where you are today. And it's something that I think is awesome, that uh, I think is just incredible, the growth that you have had. Verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. And Kim Dang just said that she couldn't be here today, but she was wanted to be with us because she's attending other service. But... Uh, <clears throat> she, uh, she sends her, 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 her love and regards. Let's go ahead and do a couple quick takeaways. Number one, God has led us to this place. And by this place, I mean the Stepping Stones Project. He has led us to this place, this date, this time, this online connection. He has led us to this place. It was not in vain. I feel that there is a point in what we have accomplished so far and I have seen great growth in where we have come to this date. Number one, God has led us to this place. It was not in vain. Number two, I don't think God led us here to stay here. He has plans. What are those plans? I don't know yet. This is what I need you to collectively join with me in, in our terms of prayer and be able to discuss with me and pray with me and talk about where do we go from here. I don't think Stepping Stone stays exactly the way it is for the years to come. How is it going to change? I'm not totally sure. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So I'm going to ask you all again, if you could make one change for Stepping Stones, what would it be? Please pray about it and email me and think about it. And I would look forward to hearing that. If you want to give me more than one, I'll take more than one. In particular, no offense, I'm not really looking quite so much for the color of the slides in the background, although that could be a point we could mention. I'm looking a little bit bigger than that, if you all follow what I'm trying to say. Or I'm not looking quite so much for the which music we play, although it could be relevant. I'm not looking for the exact, like, let's meet 10 minutes earlier. I'm kind of looking bigger, if you, you follow what I'm trying to aim for here. And, and so really spend some time in prayer for those of you that group up together, um, you know, so like maybe like Will and G, for example, or Amy and Dion or whatever, or maybe you all might group up together and, and, and talk about it, you know, however you all want to. But I really would like to hear from you as to what exactly you think, uh, we, we, where we need to head to. I, I have had one good suggestion so far, and uh, I'll keep that one in my back pocket for the moment, and uh, I'll share with you as I hear more from these. <clears throat> and that goes to number three. Is I need to hear from you where you think Stepping Stones needs to be headed. Where exactly do you think um, in the next couple of years this, uh, this needs to either evolve to, or I, do, do you think it should continue? Do you think we, you know, is, there, is there a reason to be here? Um, and I'm really looking towards uh, those two major goals I mentioned previously, salvations and personal growth. Okay, so people getting saved, and then people after getting saved, growing in Christ. Those are the two major things I'm trying to, trying to focus on and how exactly they relate to all of us. And they have to be for me in that order, okay? 
because for those of you that are already saved, while I absolutely, my heart goes out to you, I know there are people who are dying and we have to reach them first, okay? So we'll think about what that means for us and how we as a group make sure that we're reaching those that are lost and we're seeing those salvations happen. We can count those baptisms and we can talk through what's happening. And it's not about the numbers, but it's about kingdom growth for God's glory. So the question for the week, what do I think God has planned for Stepping Stones? And part two, what is my part in it? What do I think God has planned for Stepping Stones? And what is my part in it? We're at a great moment, guys. We have a phenomenal opportunity. What exactly do we do with it? Where do we go from here? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Tell me, Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the opportunity to be its pastor. And I would ask you give us all clarity of mind and heart, a sense of peace. And most of all, I ask for your wisdom so that you can help us to know where do we grow and how do we make this what you want it to be. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.